Good morning, Calvary Lighthouse Church. Trust you're doing well today. And uh, always good to be with you. Always good to worship with you. Robin, thank you for leading us wherever she went. <laughs> she was right there. She just disappeared. Um, so great to be with you all. And um, yeah, imagine, imagine you signed up. Oh, there you are. Okay. Imagine that you signed up for a contest, and if you win, you win one million dollars. Who who wants to sign up for this contest? Yeah, okay, a million dollars. And um, is that I'm I'm hearing it's like really loud to me. Maybe that's just me. Uh, yeah, because sometimes if I yell, then everybody's eardrums will be blown. Um, so this contest, a million dollars, and Here's the deal. The people running the contest can take you to any place in the world and plop you down there and you have to survive for 31 days only with the resources right around you. Now how many are in? Okay, well we got a brave woman back here, yes. Um, and how many of you are thinking, well, it would all depend on where they plop me down. How many of you would like, yeah, that would, that would matter. That would matter. Okay. And, uh, but the thing is, for this contest, you, you don't get to know that until you sign up. So you sign up, and then you find out where you're going to be put to survive for 31 days with only what is around you, just the resources around you. Okay. Any, any takers? I need, a one, I need one person to say, I'll do that. Okay. Okay. All right. We got he volunteered his wife. <laughs> Volunteer your wife? What is up with that? <laughs> She'll go. Here, my Lord, send her. Um, okay. So, we have a volunteer. So, um, here's where you're going to be. You are going to be in Costco. 31 days trying to survive in Costco. Now, think about it. What, what would you need? What would you need to survive? Whether it's Costco or anywhere else. So, let's just think about that for a minute. So, you need food. So, this is Costco. And there's a lot of food in Costco, as you know. Okay, slow down just a sec. So, and then you need something to cook the food on. But guess what? In Costco, there are grills. So, you got food. You got something to cook it on. Okay, what else do we need to survive? You got, you got to have water. Got to have water. Well, they've got a lot of water, and they have a whole lot of other beverages as well. So you're covered from the beverage point of view. Um, you need a place to sit. Come on, you don't want to just sit on the floor in Costco for 31 days. So you need a place to sit. Well, don't worry. They've got furniture there. What else might you need? Uh, let's see. What else? Uh, yes, a place to relax. Lay down, maybe. All right, so they've got the furniture for you. You need a bed. And to go along with a bed, you would also need pillows, right? And besides pillows, you would need a mattress. But guess what? In Costco, you're good. You're good. Now you're wishing you'd volunteered for this uh, $1 million, I think. Well, what else might we need? Oh, you've got to have a pharmacy, Right, for your, for your stuff, your vitamins, all the stuff that you take. So the pharmacy is there. Don't, you got to have clothes, of course. And so there's lots of clothes in Costco. So that's good. And um, let's see. Oh, and even for the luxury type, thing, you, you could have a TV because there's lots of TVs in Costco. And they're all on at one time. You need, you need a cell phone? Guess what? They have cell phones. You need what else? You need a laptop? No problem. You can keep up with work. Because there are lots of laptops in Costco. And, uh, and you need that too. Obviously, they, they've got that in Costco. So one month in Costco, <clears throat> you, are, you are abiding in Costco. You are remaining in Costco for an entire month. Definitely doable as we have just seen. Maybe even thriving a little bit away from the rush and press of life. You're just there. All of your needs are met. 
there in Costco. So, your address for that month would simply be in Costco. That's your address for that whole month. Hey, how do I contact Tom? Uh, in Costco. That's where he is. That's, that's his new address, okay? So, if we are born again, we've repented, we've given our life to the Lord, we've said, you come in and take over my life, I want to live my life for your glory, not my own. I want to serve you. I want to be a light in darkness. All these things, right? If we say that, then my question this morning is, what is your spiritual address? Where do you live? Where is the place that you can survive and even thrive? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Now, Ephesians. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. If you have a Bible app, you can turn there. But I want to just demonstrate to you what Paul was trying so hard to get the Ephesian believers to understand. Trying to understand their new address. Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna name a verse and I'm gonna read parts or the whole thing. And so just hang with me and see if you can catch what Paul was trying to tell the Ephesians their new address was. Okay? So here we go. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just before he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world. Uh, Verse 7, in him we have redemption. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intentions, which he purposed for us in him. Verse 9, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of time, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ. Things in the heavens, things on the earth, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Verse 13, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were also sealed in him. Okay, this isn't like rocket science. I hope you're catching on to where we're going here, right? Verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Chapter 2, chapter 2. Verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and has raised us up with Christ, with him, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ, (laughs) so that In the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. Verse 13, but now in Christ, you who formerly were far off have been brought near. Nineteen to twenty times in chapters one and two of Ephesians, we find in Christ with Christ, in him. So what is up with that? There's a, there's a, there are principles of biblical interpretation. There are principles of Bible study, and one of them is the principle of repetition. And when you see something in a, in a passage that's repeated over and over and over, you better pay attention because Paul, or whoever the writer is, is trying to make a point. He's stressing something, not just three times, not just five things, not just 15 times, but 20 times in a chapter and a half. He's trying to get us to understand we have a whole new address. It's in Christ. That's where we live. Now, we can live and survive and maybe even thrive in Costco. Why? Because everything we need is right there. Now, you might have to go down a couple of aisles but it's there. You might have to go a few aisles over there, but it's there. And you can set up your bed, put the mattress on it, get your sheets, get your pillows, get your food. Everything is there that you could possibly need to live there. The same is true with our new address, our spiritual address of in Christ. Everything that we need for life 
and godliness is ours in Christ. 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has granted to us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us. So when we were born again, we were placed in him. So, for example, um, I'll use this. Here's a little clicker thing I have. So here's us apart from Christ before we were saved. Here's us, here's Christ. When we were saved, we were placed in Christ. When God sees us, he sees Christ because we are in him, right? Right? Where we go, he goes, because we're in him. In fact, it even says that where he is, we are. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Now, you want to blow your brain a little bit, meditate on that for a while. But it's only true because of this truth that Paul is trying to get to the Ephesian believers over and over and over, that you are in Christ. And so, Acts 17, 28, in him, we live and move and have, right, we, we have our being, we exist right there. Now, I love the, I love the theme as Pastor Babu was sharing with me, kind of the, the theme for this year, the word for this year for Calvary Lighthouse being the word abide. And what a great word that is. That's what we're talking about. If you're going to go to Costco and live there for 31 days and try to win a million dollars, you are abiding in Costco and in the resources that Costco offers you, right? Likewise, in Christ, if we are going to not just survive, but if we are going to thrive, guess what? All the resources necessary to thrive are right there in Christ because we are in him and he is in us. Just like, just like the tree and the branch. Now, John 15 talks about the vine and the branch using a vineyard illustration. There's not a whole lot of vineyards in Omaha that I'm aware of. I did Google it. There are a few outside of Omaha. There are some vineyards, but we're not like a big vineyard. We're not like Italy or something, right? We don't, we don't have vineyards. So I like thinking a little bit more. It's the same truth of the, the tree and the branch, okay? So you can use a vine if you want to, if you're into the vineyard thing. But the tree, and the, it's the same thing. So the life-giving sap comes up from the roots Nutrients from the ground up through the roots, creates sap. The sap goes out into the branch and produces what? Fruit. Right? And so we're, we're, we're aware of that. And so when we come to Christ, another, another picture that Scripture gives us is that we are grafted into him. Now, I've never tried grafting a branch, but this, I, this is done, right? So they'll take a tree and they'll maybe scrape off some bark or something. I, I, I'm just, I'm winging this. I don't know what I'm talking about. But then they take a branch, you know, over here, maybe a shoot or something, and they'll, they'll put it in there and probably they duct tape it up or something. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's super glue. I don't know how they, but they graft it in and then the life-giving sap coming up from the tree, guess what? Because the branch is grafted in, it receives the sap, the sap comes out, the life-giving sap, and what do we have? We have fruit. Okay? So we are grafted in Receiving that life-giving sap, as it were, to use the illustration. Christ is our life source. He is what flows up in us like springs of living water rising up as we, what? Abide. As we abide in him. So, okay, now. So what does it mean to abide? What does it mean to abide in Christ? Well, a couple things. First of all, it's a choice. It's a choice. When life comes at me with challenges, struggles, temptations, I have a choice to abide in Christ or to do something stupid or selfish or sinful, right? So abiding in Christ is a choice, all right? Um, it's an intentional thought. When a challenge comes at me, when a, when a temptation comes at me, I have this intentional thought of choosing, I am going to abide in Christ because that's where I am. Everything I need for life and godliness is right here. The power I need to say no to that temptation or to rise above that challenge is right there because I am in Christ. So it's a choice. It's an intentional thought. And it's also a truth. It's a truth. Whether we feel it or not, 
whether we even um, succeed or not when a challenge comes along, it's still the truth about us. I am in Christ. We are mystically one. I'm in him, Colossians 1.27, Christ is in me. So, I need to choose to think intentionally, okay, here's the challenge, I am in Christ. Christ is in me. I'm going to abide right now in that truth. And when we do that, we find the resources necessary to win, to overcome whatever that is. Uh, but notice the intentionality. Notice the intentional thought process I'm going through. I'm, I'm remembering what's true about me. I'm abiding in that truth. I'm abiding in Christ. I'm remembering that he's in me. And so when that challenge comes, it's like, hey, I, I can win. Was there ever a challenge that Jesus faced that he didn't conquer? No. Was there ever a temptation that came to him that caused him to sin? No. That is the resource. That is the power. That is the very life that we carry because we are in Christ, abiding in him, and he's in us. Everything I need, I have in him. He is now my new identity. Wow, this is part of abiding in him. He is my new identity. What he says is true about me is true about me. I can choose to believe it or not, but it's true if I am in Christ. My identity, I, I, uh, this is so wonderful. I, I've got a list here. I just want to read it just to remind you of who you are. In Christ. Now, there's scripture with every one of these, but I'm not going to take the time to mention the scripture, chapter, book, verse. I'm just let me just let me just give this to you. Just receive this, okay? Just kind of take this in. If you love Jesus, if you're following him, th this is this is this is you. You are a child of God. You are Christ's friend. You are loved. You are crucified, buried, and risen with Christ. You are free forever from condemnation. You are adopted into the family of God. You are an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. You are more than conqueror through him. You are a possessor of the mind of Christ. You are the temple of God. You are united with the Lord, one spirit with him. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are victorious in Christ. You are a new creation in Christ. You are reconciled to God. You are an ambassador to Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are justified by faith in Christ. You are a saint. You are a chosen one. You are holy and blameless. You are accepted in the beloved. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You are a citizen of heaven. You are redeemed and forgiven of all your sins. You are one who is complete in Christ. You are saved to the uttermost. You are a member of a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are a partaker of the divine nature. Why? <laughs> Little clumsy. Because you are in Christ. And all of that and more is true about you. And God doesn't ever see you apart from Christ. Because there is this mystical union. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you in Christ. Emphasized over and over and over. Wow. So, we just close in prayer right there, I think. I don't know. But, uh, but don't worry, I'm not done. Don't get too anxious on me here. Okay. So, wonderful, wonderful truths about abiding in Christ. Now, however, you might say, that's wonderful, but time out. I still struggle. I'm still tempted. Sometimes I feel like my walk with Christ is kind of up and down. Sometimes it's like three steps forward, two steps back. It's, I mean, all those truths are wonderful and I believe them, but but my condition here on the earth doesn't always maybe reflect. What do you do with the, with the kind of gap that you sense a little bit between your position in Christ and your condition here on earth? 
I don't know about you, but sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect for me. Well, let me try to, let me try to help us with this a little bit. We need to understand our position in Christ and our condition as humans. All right, what do we mean by that? There is positional truth and there is conditional reality. So just hang with me. This, this, is, this is not rocket science. This is, we can get this, okay? But we have to understand these two truths because they help us a lot. It helps me a lot. Okay, so first of all, we, we're somewhat familiar with the process that leads to saving faith, right? You've heard me talk about this. We all start unconcerned. Then we are awakened to our spiritual need. The Lord graciously convicts us, which is his kindness leading us to repentance, and then bowing the knee and surrendering to him and putting our faith in Christ's work on the cross for us. When that happens, we are born again, right? And now abiding comes into play. This is where abiding starts to take place. And as we abide, there is this process of sanctification, of becoming more Christ-like in our condition. Everything I just read is true of us, positionally in Christ, but now there is this condition that we're dealing with day to day. All right, so next, next one, and hopefully this will, this will make... Now, don't be freaked out by that. It's a little, a little, a little complicated. But let me just die. Oh, I love it. I was wondering if this would work, and it does. So hang with me here. Here we are, right? We just came up to five steps. Here we are, up to five steps. We are saved. Now, this is, this is part of life here. We're going through life, okay? Moving left to right is what? It's a timeline. So here's a timeline. The bottom line represents time moving forward. So we've lived our life. We came here. We repented. We got saved. And what happened? Immediately, well, an uppercase repentance. We come to him. We turn from our sin, we turn from our selfish life, and we are born again. What happens? Immediately, we are justified. And immediately, that long list I just read to you becomes true of us. I mean, like that. The minute we are born again, we are immediately elevated right up to here. We are justified. What does justified mean? It's just as if I'd never sinned. I don't know who said that, but I've never forgotten it. Justified, justification. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Okay. Now we have this identity in Christ that I just read. Lots of things. This is my position spiritually. I'm all, I, I'm up here. I'm moving forward. I'm going along. My identity in Christ is clear. I'm wanting to live out of that. Okay. And we're moving from justification to sanctification to ultimately glorification. Wow. That is great. Okay. But time out. There's this other part of the chart, <laughs> right? What's the other part of the chart? The other part of the chart is my condition. This is my position. This is my condition. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a pretty good um, graphic of my journey in Christ. I don't know about you, Sometimes there's up, sometimes there's down. Sometimes there's mountaintops, sometimes there's valleys. Sometimes there's victory, sometimes there's failure. Can, don't look at me so spiritually. Can you relate to what I'm saying here? It's not a straight line. And just because when I'm saved, in, positionally I'm in Christ, doesn't mean that I'm perfect. But what it means is, my condition can continue to move onward and upward... As time goes on, I'm, this is the sanctification process. I'm becoming more and more Christ-like. I'm being transformed more and more into the image of Christ by what? Abiding in him. And the more I abide, the more updraft I get on the chart. When I don't abide, woo, I go down. When I abide, woo, I go up. <laughs> See? So... I hope that's helpful because a lot of people, when we talk about our position in Christ and talk about this amazing list, lots of times people go, well, that's, I, yeah, I believe that's true about me, but that ain't like next Tuesday or last Thursday. I mean, you should have seen me. I was a mess. <laughs> it's okay. I'm a mess too. <laughs> so we just have to understand, but it's onward and upward, right? He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So he is committed to us just like we are committed to him. And it's not always roses, 
Sometimes there's a couple thorns along the way, but we know ultimately where we're going to end up because he is kind and gracious and he is committed to our transformation. Now, here's the point. The more, the more we understand our position in Christ, the more I'm encouraged to grow in my condition. One of the most motivating things for me to want to abide and win and say yes to Jesus with every temptation and every challenge, one of the most encouraging things for me to think about is who I am in him. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. That's what the word says. Well, guess what then? I can win. And so you see how if you think about your position and everything that's true about you and your identity, it can be a great encouragement for your growth. So don't be discouraged by an occasional failure in your condition, but be greatly encouraged by your position in Christ. Um, it's like when we come to Christ and we say yes to him and he comes into our life, it's almost like there's a new DNA inside of us. It's the life of Christ. We are different. All things, not some, not a few, all things have become new. I'm just not like a, a fixed up jalopy, like a restored old car. Took a lot of work and now it's the same old car. It's just got a new paint. No, I am a, something brand new that's never existed before. So there's like this brand new DNA. Now, we've had several border collies. We have one right now, he's kind of half Aussie, Australian Shepherd, half Border Collie. These are amazingly smart dogs. They're smarter than both my kids. I don't know. It's just, um, you know, my kid's smarter than your kid, the bumpers, yeah. Yeah, my dog's smarter than your kid. You've maybe seen that one too. I could put that one on my, <laughs> they're very smart. But they, there is an instinct inside of them because of the DNA inside of them because of the breeding over generations and generations and generations that causes them to act a certain way. So we got our first, our first eight week old border collie puppy. Her name was Newbie. And um, I would run around in the backyard. And of course, as an eight, 10, 12 week old puppy, she would chase after me and follow me around, like follow me. When she got a little bit older, something clicked inside of her. And as I would try to run a circle in the backyard, she would catch the drift of where I was going and cut straight across and cut me off. She would try to herd me as if I were a sheep or a cow. I said, I'm your owner. You don't get to herd. She didn't care. If I'm curving, she would cut me off and herd me. Now, the first time she did that, she didn't go, well, let's see, I'm a border collie. So uh, what do we do? Yeah, we herd. So I'm going to cut this guy. She just did it. She didn't even know why. It's just this new instinct inside of her. I'm not a hunter, but uh, hunters tell me they have these dogs called pointers. And the dogs will be out ahead of them in the field, and they're going along. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden the dog goes. Imagine the first time. I mean, you've got little Fido out there, whatever your hunting dog's name. That's not a very good, that's more of a pup poodle. Um, bear. Your dog named Bear is out there, right? And he's going along. It's the first time he's been in the field, first time hunting, and he's going along, and all of a sudden he catches a, a drift of something in his nose, and he goes, he's going like, why am I doing this? I don't even know why I'm acting this way. Why am I frozen right here? Amen. Brand new DNA. Something inside of him says, this is who you are, right? And so when Christ comes into us, and as we abide in him, there is a new DNA inside of us that as we abide, guess what, guess what comes out? Or why? Because it's, it's in us. It's Christ in us. It's his life flowing out of us. So that person says something to the office that is so offensive, we just go, God bless you. Like, did I just say that? Did I just hear myself say, what? What was that? <laughs> Abiding in Christ. Union in Christ. So, so don't be discouraged about condition. He's committed to you and he will bring it to completion on the final day. Rejoice in your position, take encouragement from your position, think about that and let that encourage you as you go onward and upward in him. Okay, so to improve your condition, you concentrate on your identity in Christ. It's one of the best ways to grow in sanctification and Christ likeness. Knowing who you are will guide how you act. All right, good. This understanding 
This revelation, this belief, these thoughts are a great help, particularly if you're a person who has struggled with insecurity, thinking you're worthless, low self-esteem, you have, a, you have trouble forgiving other people because you take an offense so easily, you're not confident, you think you're a nobody. Man, just concentrate. Think about that list. Just Google my identity in Christ and you'll get that entire list right there. It's just right there on the internet, right? And then just maybe take one a day for a month. Get, print out 30 of them and think about one each day. And it will encourage you. It will, it will help you to not be insecure. It will help you to not be easily offended. It will help you to be confident, not cocky, but it will help you to be confident in who you are in him. And you don't need the approval of this person or that person or this person to recognize your work or anything else because you are complete in Christ. You're living to an audience of one, right? And all those things can slowly drift away as we understand who we are in Christ and we abide in those truths. I'm, I'm encouraging myself this morning. I don't know anybody else is but this is i need to be reminded of this stuff i really do now let me let me start bringing this in for landing um i want to i want to share a warning a warning with all of this because i have seen these truths this truth that we're talking about um abused i have seen them taken in a way that is not biblical so i'm just let me throw a little warning in here at the end. I don't say any of this to discredit anything I just said, because I believe everything I just said. But here's, here's just a little warning. My dad said it this way. Any biblical truth pushed beyond its biblical intention can become heresy. Interesting. I saw, I, I came across a verse that I hadn't really noticed before in Second John a few weeks ago. And it says this. Anyone who goes and he's talking about truth. Second John is about truth. You'll find the word truth repeated over and over and over and over in the first seven or eight, nine verses in, in Second John. So he's talking about truth. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ, go too far. Yes, you can take, you can take a biblical truth and you can go too far with it. You can take a, a biblical truth and push it beyond its biblical intention and end up in heresy. So, everything I said about our identity in Christ is true, absolutely. But even just this month, I was, I was tracking, reading, I follow a whole lot of leaders and pastors and movements, and, and I saw this. They can take the fact that our identi identity is now as a son or a daughter of God too far, and what happens is man can become exalted beyond what the Bible teaches. I'm a balanced guy, so this is, this is the other side of the coin of everything I've just said today, all right? The other side of the coin. So what happens is man is exalted. Jesus is the king. I'm a son of the king, so I'm a king. Okay, be careful. Be careful, because what happens is, here's God, here's man, and slowly but surely, we begin to close the gap as we exalt man beyond biblical intentions and biblical truth. And I, I'm seeing this as I, as I look out there. Not everywhere, but there's a few movements where I'm really seeing this and I'm, I'm really concerned. So I'm just throwing this word of caution in here. Um, there is the transcendence of God and the eminence of God. All right? The transcendence of God is that God is holy other. Holy other. W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other than humans. And he is also H-O-L-Y, holy other than humans. We are not God. God is not us. And so that is the, that is the transcendence. God is there. There is none like you. Our brother prayed it this morning. There is no one like you. Certainly not me. Okay. So we need to maintain that awe and respect 
for the transcendence and the holy otherness of God. Okay? But there is the eminence of God that he's right here. Emmanuel, Christ with us. Colossians 1.27, Christ in us. Ephesians 1 and 2, we are in him. And, and so while he is utterly and completely separate from us, from human beings, remember what David said, what? he looked in the stars and like, what is man that you're even mindful of us? That's the transcendence of God, right? Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. <laughs> he was not saying he was God. So, there, so that's, the, that's the transcendence that we have to maintain. Um, while at the same time we understand the eminence, the closeness, the union that we have with him. So be careful as you listen and observe and read that, that watch out for the closing gap where God is some way lowered down to more man's level and man is exalted all the way up. Because look, Christ is in you. Christ is in me. You're in union with him. I'm in union with him. You're in him. I'm in him. So I'll tell you what. I'll worship you, and then you worship me. Any truth taken too far becomes heresy. So just as you, as you move through life, and just watch out for anything that would lower God and exalt man beyond where uh, biblical intention is. Okay. And there, there, there's, there's, there's statements out there, like um, one leader said, well, uh, God is in charge, but not in control, we are. Direct quote from a big leader in a big movement. That is exalting man and lowering God, okay? Here's another one. We have the mind of Christ, right? That's part of our wonderful identity, he takes that and he says, because of that, I have tapped into God's brain and I have full access to what God thinks about everything. Oh, so now there are two omniscient beings in the universe, God and you. My ways are not your ways. <laughs> I mean, like so many verses, like what Bible are you reading to come up with this stuff? But again, what is it doing? It's exalting man and lowering God. So just be very, very careful if you, if you hear stuff like this. So everything I've been, you know, the first half hour, I'm talking about your identity in Christ, abiding in Christ, all of that is so true. But then over here, just be careful. Just, just watch out. Because uh, there are people that take it too far. Okay. Uh, one, one more, talk about lowering God. A worship leader in one of these big movements said this, I view the Holy Spirit like, like the genie from Aladdin. He's blue, he's funny, he's sneaky, and he's silly. Yeah, that is sick. And so what are we doing? We're lowering God. Now he's like the genie from Aladdin. Stop it. Stop it. He is wholly other than we are. Well, I could go on, but I won't. So just be careful. Be careful about that. Meditate on the branch and the vine choose to abide, to remain in the truth of your new identity. You're, you, you're, not, you're not having to live in Costco for 31 days, but if you did, everything would be there that you need. Your address would be in Costco. Spiritually, you have everything you need in Christ. Your new address is in Christ. That's where you live and move and have your being. So study and meditate on who you are in Christ, think, meditate on your new identity in him. Thanks, Robin. Come on up. Let the security from that new identity, let that security from who you are in Christ make you a confident, not cocky, full of faith, follower of Jesus. As you abide in him like a branch abides in the trunk of the tree. I've told you this before, I think, but I've never gone by a tree and have heard the branches grunting. <laughs> Trying to push some fruit out at the end of the branch. Never heard a grunting tree. 
And as we abide in Christ, we move from striving to be like Jesus to abiding in Jesus. And naturally what happens? That new DNA, that new person begins to come out. And sometimes we'll even be amazed at our own, at our own actions and responses to people as we abide in him. Let's bow our heads. I'm just wondering this morning, if there's anybody here who I just want to pray. And if there's anybody here that maybe just raise your hand and say, you know, when it comes to being insecure, having no confidence, being timid, being fearful, I'm just going to raise my hand and say, I struggle with that. And would you just pray that my do, new identity in Christ would, would, would be today a fresh new revelation for me? Would you just raise your hand at this point? I just want to pray. Yeah. So, Father, we, we thank you for who you are in us and for who we are in you. Thank you, Lord, as we abide in you and that life-giving flow of your very life starts to come out of us we can move in confidence we can move with full assurity and faith knowing that we are indeed a son or a daughter of god loved accepted forgiven justified healed and the list could go on and on and on lord we thank you for that thank you for the all of those things, Lord, purchased on the cross for us through your hard dying. That we could say, the old is past. Everything has become new because I am in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. Thank you for our position in you. It encourages our condition on the earth. May we think, concentrate, and meditate on everything that you say we are. May we glorify you, Lord, in our thought, our deed, our words. Be glorified, Lord, we pray. Let's uh, sing our benediction to each other today, okay? again the Lord bless the Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you
one more time. The Lord bless. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. Go in the peace of the Lord. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Sunday.